calling all entrepreneurs. Get ready because today, Obamacare and your business is hashtag straight out of the pulse. We're turning the tables today. Coming up next. Hello, I'm Denise Roberts, and welcome to The Pulse. If there's one thing that has stood the test of President Barack Obama's time in office, it's the Affordable Care Act, better known as Obamacare. Obamacare is a law that was clearly intended to help people, which, in all fairness, it actually is helping people. However, even with activities as recent as the United States Supreme Court upholding a key portion of this law in a 6-3 decision, Making subsidies available for people in all 50 states and not just people who bought insurance through a state exchange, it still deserves the question, how is this law impacting small and minority firms' ability to do business in the United States, the state of Maryland, and of course, Prince George's County? Today, joining me to turn the tables is Al Redmer, Commissioner for the Maryland Insurance Administration, returning guest Shawanda Williams, CPA and Financial Manager for Accounting and Tax Solutions, and Janice Davis, Vice President, the Living Capital Group. Thank you all for joining us today. Thanks, Thanks for having us. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of our discussions on this show are centered around economic development in the county and how small and minority businesses are impacted. So, Commissioner, I really wanted to start with you. Um, can you talk about some of the provisions of uh, the Affordable Care Act and specifically how the state of Maryland, in the state of Maryland, um, the impacts are on Maryland businesses? Sure. A a and as we were speaking before the show, so actually, um, the uh, changes in Maryland have not been as great as elsewhere in the country because if you uh, oversimplify the debate of the Affordable Care Act, uh, it, it basically boils down into one of two buckets, and that is uh, having access to health insurance and the issue of affordability. Mm -hmm. If we look just at the issue of access in Maryland for the last 25 years, uh, there really hasn't been anybody that couldn't buy health insurance mm -hmm if they wanted to and if they could afford it. If, uh, if they were poor, they had access to Medicaid. If they were elderly, they had access to Medicare. Mm -hmm. If they were employed, they may have access to an employer-sponsored plan. Mm -hmm. If not, uh, they could get in the medically underwritten market. Okay. And if they couldn't qualify for that, uh, they had access to Maryland's health insurance plan, mm -hmm. which was a high-risk pool for folks that otherwise couldn't buy health insurance. So in Maryland, the issue of access really hasn't changed much. Now, however, um, there are nuances with that. So the, uh, the high risk pool was eliminated and now we have guaranteed issue in the uh, formerly medically underwritten market. Uh, but the issue of access really hasn't changed. Uh, most of the impact has been for individuals that, that otherwise couldn't find coverage. So let's let's look at um, uh, the individual mandate. What mm -hmm. are the effects on employees and businesses? But specifically businesses, let's get to that first. So, you know, in Maryland, you have to own a health insurance policy mm -hmm. or, uh, or pay a penalty. Okay. If you are employed um, through an, through a spo uh, an employer-sponsored plan, mm -hmm. Uh, they can choose to have insurance or not. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's a, a larger company, they have to offer it or suffer, uh, suffer penalties. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, the effects of the Affordable Care Act, though, uh, has, has created an environment where more and more small employers mm -hmm. are discontinuing their employee benefit plan uh -huh. and requiring their employees to go through the exchange in the individual market. So, Janice, can you um, talk about some of the important rules that yeah. small businesses yeah. now need to be paying attention to? I think one of the big things is as a broker, and in this area we're metropolitan, and I do have to give the commissioner in Maryland a lot of credit mm -hmm. because basically you are really <clears throat> on the forefront of the change. Mm -hmm. We didn't have to. Basically, there are laws in every single jurisdiction. In D.C., you're mm -hmm. mandated to be on the exchange, mm -hmm. whether it be individual or shop. Mm -hmm. Virginia, no mandate. Maryland. But Maryland was always community rating. Right. So unlike D.C., where you had to be individually underwritten and your groups were affected, mm -hmm. whether you, if you had a cancer or something like that, even in the small group, your rates were much higher. 
So Maryland, again, has been very much on the forefront of that. Mm -hmm. But as an individual, um, everything as well as now in small group, and small group will now extend in 2016 mm -hmm. up to 100. You are mandated, basically, everyone throughout the mm -hmm. United States is mandated sure. to have co coverage. And mm -hmm. I think you can probably talk to the tax penalties to yeah, that as right. well. Okay. But um, if, in fact, in Maryland, we will now be able to purchase business in terms of small businesses on the shop, which right. I also think is going to be a wonderful, um, Maryland had a bit of a <clears throat> misadventure with the shop, but now it's great. Okay. And so I think that's going to afford individuals and small businesses a, a larger opportunity. But the penalties and the compliance issues are going are deterrents for, for small companies offering coverage. And, and that's okay. a big issue. There, there are compliance penalties right. uh, at the federal level for businesses that, that, <clears throat> that may be out of compliance uh -huh. even if they don't offer a benefit exactly. plan. The other issue is the Affordable Care Act has made it more complicated for businesses uh, to buy and pay for their insurance because the Affordable Care Act requires each uh, employee to be charged based on their own current uh, age. So if you have 10 employees, you might have 10 different premiums that you're paying as opposed to one premium that you had before. Okay, let's talk about um, incentives. What are, what are the available tax credits for well, let's uh, look at for the, the issues and um, what I have found, Denise, particularly coming up this past tax season, mm -hmm. um, particularly for the individual um, person, the tax filer, as a person who you know does prepares taxes uh, for small businesses and uh, individuals. Mm -hmm. What I found that this previous tax season that the individual was not as educated about the mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. in terms of right. being aware of the premium tax credits. Sure. They knew they had to uh, have health um, care coverage. However, they really did not understand the implications of all the new forms and everything that mm -hmm. were related to it. Mm -hmm. So when it became tax times in preparation this time, a lot of taxpayers were somewhat surprised, you know, mm -hmm. by the new forms and how, you know, if they did not pay enough um, in terms of their premiums that they could possibly get liabilities or refunds. Okay, we've got a lot to talk about, so um, we got to go to break, so just give me one second. Stay with us because we're coming right back to this conversation. But before we go to break, did you know that Congressional Quarterly recently reported that fewer people worked for companies with health coverage in 2014 and that the biggest decline in employee coverage occurred among small firms with fewer than 50 workers? Wow. We're going to talk about this when we come back. People think I'm trash, but they're wrong. Today I'm just an aluminum can, but one day I could be a stadium. Welcome back. If you're just tuning in, we're turning the tables on President Obama's Affordable Care Act. So I just wanted to read something really quick. Congressional Quarterly um, reports that fewer employees worked for companies that offered health insurance in 2014 and, quote, that insurance cost them more with higher deductibles, especially for family coverage plans, according to an annual report from Agency for uh, health care research and quality. The agency said in the report, continuing a trend that began in 2008, the percentage of employees working in an establishment where insurance was offered fell from 84.9% in 2013 to 83.2% in 2014, a uh, decline of 1.7 percentage points. Uh, Janice, I just, what, 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 is, what do you make of this? What's going on here? Well, I'm a business owner, and I work for business owners as a broker. And uh, Al and I were talking before we came on, and we said, let's change it to CA. It's no longer affordable. <laughs> and why? And not only is it not <clears throat> affordable, but it's not predictable. Before, you used to be able to do what you call average age. Mm -hmm. Now everything is age banded. Mm -hmm. I have a very small firm. I, actually, I'll use my daughter as mm -hmm. an example. My daughter is... Uh, 
before, basically, you had family coverage. Now everything is age banded. <laughs> Let's say you're 30, your premium may be 400. I'm 50, I wish. <laughs> but my premium may be. I'm 51. Okay, and he's 51. <laughs> I'm, I'm, my premium is 600, and his is 1,000. Now, if I want to go higher, mm -hmm. Al, I know that I'm going to have to pay $1,000 a month. If I'm going to hire you, I'm going to pay $300 a month. So affordability is an affordability issue Affordability is a huge issue with age banding. Mm -hmm. If my daughter wants coverage, she had a family coverage before, now she has to add her age, mm -hmm. her, her spouse's age, and three other children. So, but so beyond the, that, mm -hmm. the complexity, mm -hmm. as she was saying, the reporting. You've got W-2s, you've got to keep track of the number of hours. We need someone like an accountant. Most small firms mm -hmm. do not have HR people. Mm -hmm. There's so much compliance. Mm -hmm. The Department of right. Labor now is saying basically they're going to audit all employee benefit firms to make sure that you're right. Mm -hmm. The IRS is involved. So the regulation has scared so many employers and they do not have to offer it in the 50 and under market. Previously, if you wanted to go to a firm, the first thing you looked at were the employee benefits along with salary because that's compensation. Mm -hmm. Now people are saying, gee, we're going to offer a plan. We're not going to offer that PPO plan. Mm -hmm. You're going to take an HMO plan. Mm -hmm. I think you even have an HSA, which is a higher we deductible do. plan mm -hmm. as the, the benchmark. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to be able to give people the same coverage that we had before. So, so. this is a law that businesses, it's a lot to understand here. a lot here. to understand. And a lot. you can't do it by yourself, now, especially the smaller businesses. Can you speak to what some of those credits are that we were talking about, some of those exemptions? Well, when you get to the exemptions, one of the things that's required is, you know, of course the small businesses can get some of the credits related to it. However, the implications, again, goes back to the premium tax credit. Mm -hmm. For example, um, in processing your information on the return, every de ind independent that mm -hmm. you process also has to have coverage. Mm -hmm. If not, you're going to have to pay for coverage for that individual. Mm -hmm. right. For example, the amount in 2015 is going to be $695 per person or 2% of household income mm -hmm. if you are not covered under a plan. Mm -hmm. It increases even more in 2016. Mm -hmm. So for um, the penalty for not having health insurance is going to increase. Mm -hmm. And most, again, as I said earlier, the issue I find is an, the education of it. Right. Most taxpayers are just not aware. And I do believe it's something that you're going to have to talk to your CPA mm -hmm. or your preparer about because you have to deal with household income issues mm -hmm. for small businesses build businesses, as she said earlier, you're dealing with um, making sure you're recording your health insurance premiums on your W-2s. There is compliance mm -hmm. um, reporting. Um, you definitely need to consider the human resource aspect of it. Mm -hmm. um, some people or small business are even making um, consultations with human resource representatives mm -hmm. to make sure they are covered. So for the small business owner, it's just a lot of more compliance and paperwork. And as she said earlier, you're really going to reevaluate uh, assessing, you know, how you're going to hire based on these insurance premiums you have to pay. Yeah. And that really is a reminder for all of us, particularly the small business market, mm -hmm. that um, with all of the, uh, the complexity, with all of the options, it's really critical to find a trained mm -hmm. professional broker um, that they can get advice from. Thanks for the uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> That's true. It's true. A CPA. Uh, yeah. it, it's really critical to have a trained professional to help navigate through all of these things, even if all they want to do is go to the exchange. Uh, the brokers can help them work through okay. the benefit options sure. that the navigators sure. okay. might not be you able know, to. I, I, I'm sorry. I really appreciate um, how you put it all into context here and help us understand um, how this impacts business and how we do it here in Prince George's County and, and Prince George's County, Maryland. I want to say thank you to Commissioner Al Redmer, Shawanda Williams, and Janice Davis. And that's our show for today. Thank you for tuning in. To see any of our previous episodes, just go to our website, diversity.mypgc.us, and click on the pulse. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at PGC Diversity and our YouTube channel, The Pulse TV. If you would like to submit a photo of you representing your small business, send it to us on Twitter at PGC Diversity. Be sure to use the hashtag SelfieOnThePulse. I'm Denise Roberts, and we're going to see you next time.